Seriously. If you have a question about something, come see me about it, man. But I don't want to make statements, particularly I caught Kenny before he put it on the internet. I don't want people to get the influence that I said something stupid because I thought I was a cool guy, or maybe I just missed it because I'm lazy. You don't understand the seriousness of this Bible. Yeah. It's eternal, man. And you know, I don't want to be held accountable for it. I've got a lot to answer for. I don't want to be answered for changing it, messing up, or making statements that mislead people, particularly save people, and their appearance to the judgment of Christ. So I said that uh, Ephesians 5 is a great mystery regarding the body of Christ, the, the church, the husband and wife relationship and all that. And then we uh, made a comment about Mystery Babylon. That's pretty neat how that's a whorish woman and we're supposed to be a chaste virgin and all that. But look at 1 Timothy 3, 16. Should have known this the first mystery we, we went over. Of course, it's attacked in every other Bible. Verse 16 says this, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Good job, Dave. How, how'd you miss that one? God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached of the Gentiles, believed on the world, received of the glory. That's a great mystery. That God would take upon him a body, a flesh in God's blood body, come down here and live a sinless life for 33 and one half years, and then give his life up willingly and rise up three days, three nights later. That's a great mystery. So I wanted to clear that up. So you got Mystery Babylon, you've got the mystery of Christ in the church. And you got this mystery as being great mystery, so so don't want to don't want to mislead anybody. I certainly don't want to misquote the word of God and be very wrong. Well so, all right, brother Jonathan, come on up. No way, man. This is good. All right. I'm not sure he does. He enjoys torturing us. Figure out how studying, the best way for me to study, I guess. Um, so last time we were up here, we were looking in the book of John and how Christ as God has control over everything that's going on through the book of John. Um, there is one thing that I wasn't sure of. If we go to John chapter 12. And as I worked through it, I didn't take the time prior to figure out where this fit. But coming back to it, I did kind of leave off here, so we're going to pick it up again. In uh, chapter 12, verse 23 to 36, that's not even accurate. We'll go uh, verse 20. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall to the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any, if any man serve me, him will my father honor. Um, in verse 23 is kind of where everything comes into play for this illustration. Um, all through John, we saw two, two phrases that kind of popped out to me, and it was that his hour is not yet come, and that he was not yet glorified. Um, but in verse 23, that it, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And it's after these few Greeks or Gentiles show up, and I got a little bit of a connection when I started thinking about what's what would be the purpose of God being glorified or honored at that time when two ran, a few random Gentiles show up for the feast? It doesn't say that they you know, were operating on the Old Testament platform. I can never remember the word, so that's always good. <laughs> um, but it, it struck me that Christ came to be crucified to provoke the Jews 
to jealousy. So if we go over to Romans 10, I know I'm throwing Ken off with this because I told him we weren't going to turn anywhere through this whole study, and, and here we go. Um, chapter 10 of Romans 18 to 21. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses saith, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. Um, but Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not, and was made manifest unto them that asked not after me. But to Israel he saith, All day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. And then again in chapter 11, in verse, I think it's 11. Nope. Yes, verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall salvation is come unto the Gentiles, for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be, riches, be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the, the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. So, in John chapter 12, these few Gentiles, the Greeks, show up, and now he's glorified. Now he's getting to the point where the hour is coming that he is glorified. And then following in the passage in chapter 12, he tells of the death that is to come for him. So you see those two phrases start to get put into play. Um, so I just wanted to point that out before... I really got into it, but let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for this morning. I thank you for the time that we have here. I thank you for this book and, and the words that you've given to us to, to know you, Lord. I do thank you for that. I thank you for your salvation for us and everything that you've provided in that. And, and just knowing that it is settled. Once we settle it with you and once we come to you in the knowledge of Christ our Savior, Lord, I do thank you for that and just everything that it, it means to us here. I do pray that you would help us not to be uh, slack considering this word and everything you have for us. I pray that you would help us to, to go out and preach your word to, to those you tell us to, Lord. Not just keep it to ourselves, but to spread it. I just pray you'd be with this service. Help my mind and my words to be exactly what you have them to be. In Jesus' name, amen. So, moving on with see, seeing Christ's control as God. Uh, if we go over to chapter 13. We'll look at verses 1 through 11. It still makes me laugh that I make myself do this. <laughs> and Ken's going to really like it when we get to chapter 19. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the, into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things un, into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth up from supper, and laid aside his garments, and took a towel, and girded himself. After that he poureth water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus saith, unto, Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him, before, therefore 
said he, ye are not all clean. Um, so again, in, in the first few verses, we see that the hour is approaching. And he knows it's coming. Again, we, this is about his control as God. He knows what's going to happen. He knows when it's going to happen. And we've seen through the rest of John that he maintains his timing by avoiding the Pharisees, the chief priests, all that. He avoids them in the first half when he needs to, to keep his timing. Um, and in 13, we see where Judas starts coming into play, and he knows that the devil is with him. Um, and in verse 18 through 30, I speak not of you all, I know whom I have chosen, but, the, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it come, that when it is come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send, receiveth me. And he that receiveth me, receiveth him that sent me. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit, and testified, and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples who Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he, he spake. Uh, Jen and I tried the code word thing and the signals for when it's time to go, it's time to leave an event. It didn't work, but these guys had it figured out. So I'd, those little details just are cool to me. Jen knows that when I tell a story, I'm typically starting at Adam and working every detail all the way up to current events. For a story at work, that lasted an hour. So these little details are, are things that I enjoy seeing in the Word. <clears throat> he then, lying on Jesus' breast, said unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then, Jesus saith, then said Jesus unto him, thou, That thou doest, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag, that Jesus had said unto him, Buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. Um, in verse 27, I just think it's, it's interesting because it's after he receives the sop, Satan enters, and Christ pretty much tells him, if you're going to go do it, hurry up. Let's go. It's time to go. Keep the timing. Keep what we need to do. I have a schedule. And he tells Satan, let's go. Do it quickly. So, in chapter 15, <clears throat> verse 13, we see where Christ is starting to lay down his life. It's, it's his choice. It's not... It, it, he is commanded from God to do it, but he's doing it willingly. It, it's not... He's not being dragged everywhere. He is, he is doing it of his own, his own will, or God's will, which is the same, but different. That's one of the weird things. It, it, you believe it, but you might not al always understand it. But verse 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Again, he, he laid his life down on purpose. Um, and let's jump over to chapter 18. You good? 
Guido, loud enough? Can you hear me? All right, I'll pick it up a little. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the book Cedron, where was a garden into the which he answered, and his disciples. And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons. Jesus therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then as, they had said, as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And I forgot where I, I always forget where I'm supposed to stop. And Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way. That the saying might be fulfilled, which he spake of them, which thou gavest me, have I lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into, thy, into the sheath, the cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Annas first, for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Um, back in verse 4, Jesus therefore, knowing all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Who seek ye? He knows so much of what's going on, he knows they're on their way over. He meets them. He doesn't wait for him to come see him while he's sitting down, relaxing, you know, ask him to bring a water over while he's sitting there or anything like that. He, he's proactive about it. He gets up and he goes and meets them at the gate. So he, again, we already saw that the hour has come. He knows what's going to happen. So he keeps going with his timing. Um, you ready, Ken? Mm -hmm. Chapter 19. Read? Yeah, you're reading. The whole thing. <laughs> no, I, I, if I make other people read, I get lost in my own thoughts. So, <sighs> Chapter 19. This is... There, there's no way I, I can't read the whole chapter because of what chapter it is. It, it is... It's a chapter of his crucifixion, and that's, it's a great reminder for me personally to go through the whole thing, but all throughout the whole chapter, you see all the different aspects, again, of his control. Um, all right. Chapter 19. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head that they put him that they put on him a purple robe, and said, "Hail, King of the Jews!" And they smote him with their hands. <clears throat> Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto them, "Behold, I bring him forth to you that ye may know that I find no fault in him." Then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said unto them, "Behold the man." When the chief priests, therefore, and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. He didn't make himself the Son of God. He is the Son of God. When Pilate, therefore, heard that saying, he was the more afraid. And went again unto the judgment hall, and said, saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speak thou not unto me? 
Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldest have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he that and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he him there, therefore unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of, the, of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha where they crucified him and two other with him, on either side one, and Jesus in the midst. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place, was, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to, and made four parts to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from top throughout. They said therefore among themselves, Let us not rend it, but cast lots for it whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things therefore the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother, and the disciples standing by, whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then said he, to his, said he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews therefore, because it was the preparation that the, the Jews therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for the Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forth came, forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled: a bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. And after this, Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about an hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices, as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulcher, wherein was never man yet laid. There laid they Jesus, therefore, because of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulcher was nigh at hand. You got to wonder sometimes when you're reading it. 
the only thing I could notice when I was reading is just how quiet it was. And that's just cool. That's awesome to me because I know everybody here has the reverence for God and Christ that this, how important this really is and what it really means to every one of us. And that's oddly encouraging to me, I guess. But we saw all throughout the chapter, and I don't know that I need to even point them all out, because I think everybody here is probably smarter than me, that you could see the points being made. Um, but every, every time it said the Scripture being fulfilled, that's, that's His control. That's, that's God's plan. That's His timing. That's everything that we're looking at through this, this book in, this, in these lessons. It all... You can see the control, the timing, everything. Um, we see that he he is not struggling to be on the cross physically. Uh, he makes a proclamation to his mother and the disciple with an exclamation point. I mean, I get tired at work and I'm barely, I'm slurring my words because I'm ready to go take a nap. Man. And he's... You know, he's dying up on the cross and he's shouting about it. You know, that's, that's not, you know, the last push at the end of a race when you're running. That's not, you got five seconds left in a football game and you're going to hoof it down for the Hail Mary touchdown. It, he's not struggling. Um, but we do see... When he's dealing with Pilate, he answers when he's supposed to, and he doesn't when he's not. That's, that's all his, I mean, that's the control that he has. Um, I don't know, that's just, like I said, I, I could not read the whole chapter, knowing which one it is, you know. Um, and he gave up the ghost. We saw that in 1513, that he laid down his life. And again, we see it when he gave up the ghost. He, he let it go when he was supposed to. Um, so yeah, there's that chapter. How'd I do, Ken? Very well. Very well, thank you. Did I get a gold star? Chapter 20, and look at verses 1 through 18. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulcher. I don't know how, I don't know if that actually shows how much he loved Christ, but I'm going to run a little faster for certain people than others, if I'm being honest. Bert? You might get a nice slow jog. <laughs> Jen gets a full out sprint. You know, I mean, it's just, that's the way it goes. But it, again, it's those goofy little details that I guess I just pick up on that you can see in your own life where you put the effort in. Um, and he stooping down, verse 5, and he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes, lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeing the linen clothes lie. You get there first, but you don't go in. And then the guy that gets there second goes in first. So who, who won the foot race? Who knows? Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulcher, and see if the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, 
but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. And seeth two angels in white, sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they, said, and they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back, and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, Tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said unto her, Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Uh, so in chapter 20, we see his resurrection. Um, again, his control. He rose himself as God to prove everything he was supposed to. Um, it's verse 9 for as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Um, it's interesting to me because we look back on it and we know it. We know it so well we forget it sometimes. But they didn't know and they still believed everything he said. <clears throat> and that's, that's something that I know I would like to be a point where I'd like to be at for myself is to just believe what he says. Every word. I, I joked earlier about not understanding part of the, the Godhead and how it really works, but you don't need to know how it works. He just There are certain things I know I'm never going to understand in this book, in life, but God has that laid out for us exactly what we need. He gives us the understanding we need when we need it. And they didn't know or understand that he would rise from the dead, but we get to look back, and this isn't a look forward, look backward to the cross thing, but we do have the privilege of looking back and seeing, again, throughout this book, what Christ has done for us. Um, and I forget. You know, th you do. You know things so well, you forget them. You know where your couch is, so you don't think about it. And when you vacuum and it's moved a half an inch, that pinky toe is gonna find it. You know, and it's and this is this is this is me. I I know. I know salvation too well that I forget it. I know it too well that. I don't want to share it because you think it's common knowledge. But, you know, this is not really where this was going to go, but that's what the Lord's putting on my heart right now is seeing the control that Christ has. He's given us the spirit of understanding so that we can go share these types of things with others, share His salvation with the world. Um, we more or less have control. We have the free will to do what we want here. We're responsible for it, without a doubt. We're going to give an account for it. But we have our own personal control in this life. So why don't we take control to Go share it. I, you know, P 
people do say this book is boring. Um, I've said it myself. I don't understand it, so I don't want to read it. Uh, but the more you read it, the more you see those little details. If you pay attention, I mean, even um, verses, verse seven and verse twenty, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. You know, I, I kind of wonder who who folded the napkin and put it over there. It did did Christ on his way out make the bed? I mean, it's, it's a goofy thought, and I, I do not mean it to be disrespectful, but it's what purpose does that show? And that's something I, you know, having noticed that now, I want to see if there's anything else for it. I want to go study why is that napkin folded and off in its own place, separate. It's a kind of a weird thing to me. So it's kind of... Seeing God's control, we ought to take the control ourselves in our lives to share the gospel, but also take the control to study this word, yeah. see the details. Um, I don't have a tape measure today, so I can't, you know, well, another time earlier this year we went through the ark. Those details, I, that's just me, I guess. Seeing, actually going through things, Taking my time reading instead of just reading to read has been, yeah. it's been cool. There's no, there's no other way I can put it because I'm very simple-minded. But seeing the details has been very encouraging for me. So just like the last time, I encourage you to pay attention to details. It can make all the difference in your reading yeah. and how exciting this book really can be. So yeah, that's Christ's control as God in the book of John. And unlike Paul and Ken, you have 18 minutes. <laughs> Let's pray. Dear Lord, I do thank you again for this morning. I thank you for the time that we've had in your word. I do thank you for um, the opportunity to be up here in this pulpit and, and just be encouraged and, and provoked to study, Lord. And, and uh, I do thank you for that. I thank you for our pastor, Brother Dave, just having us do this, not to you know, torture us, but just to, just to get us studying, to get us thinking more about you, to, to help us in our growth, Lord. I do thank you for that. I thank you for <clears throat> everyone here uh, and the encouragement that they've all been in my life. I do thank you for this book. I thank you for the words of God that you've given to us to, to look at, to read, to study, to, to gain the understanding that you would have us to gain. Lord, I do thank you for it. I thank you for just everything you provide for us. I thank you for your salvation and, and seeing how, how you maintained your timing, your control, and just knowing that that didn't end at the cross and end in in the Gospels, but it continues on to this day. You, you have control, even still today. You'll have control in the future. You will come back and be the king of, of this world. You will have that honor and glory, Lord. I do thank you for that. I thank you for just saving my soul, Lord. I thank you for getting to look forward to, to seeing you. And... Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to the days where you are king, Lord. It is, it's taken me a long time to get to that point, Lord. But I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.
I know a lot of people say, well, it's a Middle Eastern custom. You wrap up the napkin, say you're coming back. But for me personally, around that napkin in the Bible, you find it a couple, several times, Lazarus had around his head, and he told the disciples, you loose him. I resurrect them, now you go loose them. It's your job, job to train them, disciple them, get them out of those bonds. But then that napkin, to fold that napkin up, what do you got to probably do, huh? You're not going to fold that napkin up if there's a pound in it. Jesus Christ is saying, I gave everything for you folks. It's finished. Amen. All right. It's a weird thing. We have a lot of time before 11 o'clock. <laughs> See you in a few minutes, man. Amen. A few.